Howling in the North, a short horror story, written by Stories from the Attic, narrated by Robin McConnell. People from the lower countries, those that are geographically further south and which consequently feel nothing like the cold that we feel, often talk of winter's bite. Where I'm from, in the upper countries, specifically in the far north of Norway, close to the boreal forests and within touching distance of the Arctic Circle, winter does not simply bite. Here, winter chews. Here, where we experience six months of daylight, endless days when the sun refuses to set, and in the other six months a stretch of darkness as long and cold as death, we really feel the winter. At that time of year nothing grows and almost nothing moves, save for tending to the caribou and dogs, or collecting extra firewood. There is nothing to drag us from our homes, the world beyond our closed doors being a barren wilderness of nothing. We try not to go outside unless we have to. Though, of course, the air itself does not freeze, it sometimes feels like it has. In winter, an awful glassy stillness comes over the town and the surrounding area, and with most people remaining inside for weeks on end, any venture outside, especially on a windless day, is like an excursion into silence. The scenery, or rather lack of it, when you look away from town, stretches out from you in a sea of uniform blank, the horizon line between the land and the sky removed, as if it had been sketched lightly onto the earth, like a pencil line on a sheet of blank paper that had been erased by a god who'd thought better of putting it there in the first place. The only thing that disrupts this wall of uniform blank is the forest, Around two miles from town it erupts from the deep navy shadow of the night in jagged lines of conifer and pine, jutting from the ground like the teeth of some slumbering giant. The only thing that disrupts this wall of uniform blank is the forest. Around two miles from town it erupts from the deep navy shadow of the night in jagged lines of conifer and pine, jutting from the ground like the teeth of some slumbering giant. The boreal forest, or taiga forest, marks the boundary between this, the edge of civilization, and the vistas of ice to the north. It is always surprising to me to hear that most people have never heard of the boreal forest. Whilst every school child in the world seems to have heard of the Amazon, and most can probably point to it on a map, the taiga remains almost mythical. You would think that a mass of trees that literally encircles the globe, or at least the top of it, stretching across Canada, Scandinavia, and Russia, and containing the largest concentration of trees anywhere on earth, would be a little more famous, but it isn't. Like many things tucked away up here at the top of the world, the forest seems to somehow have been all but forgotten. Though, of course, just because things are forgotten does not necessarily mean they have entirely gone away. Usually, in winter, to venture away from the houses and toward the forest means only two things, silence and dark. Whilst the town itself still buzzes and throbs with the frantic muttered scurrying of human activity, outside of town, even at a distance of a single kilometre, sound and light begin to fade until eventually they disappear, the few birds that venture this far north have long departed, as perhaps we should have, for warmer climes in the south. The dogs which in winter are kept close to the houses or in heated sheds bark and howl from time to time, but even this sound fades into hush the further away you go, muffled and swallowed by the snow. The experience of walking away from town, toward the trees, is like wading into the ocean at night, at first the dull rhythm of people remains, a low, reassuring hiss, the odd click and high-pitched laugh, the lights still dance as flickering reflections on the surface, and you know you can find your way back, but if you look away, if you allow your eyes to fix on the direction you're heading, rather than what you're leaving behind, just for a moment, then, all too soon, 
those few remnants of life vanish until all that remains, all that there is, is silence and dark. Usually. In the winter of 2002, however, things changed. That year, for four and a half months, silence and dark were not the only things waiting at the edge of the forest. That year, there was something else. It started with a sound, a tearing, echoing screech that rang through the emptiness like a clarion call. When papers in the South reported how this sound had terrorized the community for weeks, they referred to it as a howling, which we in town, viewing the copy many months later, thought was ridiculous. For anyone who had actually heard the sound, the word howling seemed not only inaccurate, but deeply, almost insultingly, inadequate. A howl, you see, is a familiar sound up here, not from wolves, though we do have arctic foxes, but from the huskies and other sleigh dogs that we keep. To hear the packs baying at the moon is not uncommon for us, nor is it in any way unsettling. I remember, for example, the first time I read Bram Stoker's Dracula. I had been attending a university in Oslo at the time, far from my hometown, and surrounded by other literature students who could not understand for a second why I found the Count's famous line about the wolves so funny. In case you have not read it, Whilst the protagonist, Jonathan Harker, is unnerved by the sound of wolves howling from the forests surrounding the infamous castle, the Count reacts with pleasure to the sound, encouraging Harker to listen to them, the children of the night, what music they make. A line that most even now will hear in Bela Lugosi's thick Eastern European accent, and which seems to show the Count as intimidating, or at very best, a little strange. For my classmates, the Count's reference to the wolves as children of the night made him seem wild and sinister, because affinity with these beasts mirrored his own savagery, and the fact that he referred to their discordant baying calls as music was incomprehensible, characterizing him as a lover of wicked or dark things. For me, however, the line not only made perfect sense, but was almost word for word what my grandmother would say whenever the dogs would start howling outside. Sometimes she would laugh and talk about them singing again, and joke that they made a better choir than the collection of red-faced and overweight ladies who would bellow the hymns at the church services every Sunday. To us, howling isn't scary. That sound, though... The sound that came pealing and gurgling from the forest, filling the air like a thunderclap, chilled my blood faster than any arctic storm. Some said it was bears, forced south by the melting of the ice, the consequent inability to hunt and resulting lack of food. When someone else pointed out that the sound was nothing like a bear, these newly christened experts in animal behaviour would explain that the sound was made by numerous bears calling at the same time. That, despite usually being solitary animals, the bears had been forced together by circumstance and were now travelling in packs, scouring the frozen barrens of the forest for food. When they came up short, they would wander close to town in search of a meal, roaring and howling because they were hungry, or so the theory went. It sounded far-fetched, but when the alternative explanation was some folk tale about the trees themselves wailing, it began to sound more plausible, especially when believing in packs of bears or wailing trees allowed people to ignore the most hideously striking thing about the calls, the fact that in their timbre, tone, and pitch, they sounded for all the world like voices. As if, impossible as it might have been, they were made by a person. Not a bear, but a human being. My grandmother insisted the call was a cry of pining or of pain, from some injured beast or a thing neither animal nor man. It was, she said, the sound of a soul being ripped from the body, or else it is the echoing space left inside one when there is no soul at all. 
The calls, long, ponderous, and prolonged wails of agony, rang out from the inky darkness of the tree-line for weeks, and with every fresh call the people shuddered. Men who had been speaking would grow suddenly silent, exchanging glances and looking furtively toward the barred doors of their cabins. Women would clutch their children to them, and at times, when the sound became too bad, cover their ears with their hands, attempting to shield them from the fear that seeped and spread with the sound, out from the forest and into the town. In some ways it was the not knowing, not being able to put a face or a shape to the sound that was worse, for in the absence of certainty strange shapes can form. Had the weather not been as severe as it was, the roads blocked with snow or so treacherous they could not have travelled, many would, I know, have left in the first week. When, in the second week, the sound seemed to come closer, one or two people attempted to make the journey, only to return later the same day with news that any such escape was impossible. It wasn't until well into the third week, with winter at its height and the other townsfolk begging him not to go, that Elias, stubborn as always, tied the chains to the ties of his pickup and sped out of the village, determined to reach the nearest city. When he did not return, a day, two days, or a week later, we could only hope that he had made it. In those first weeks, some, already terrified by the sounds themselves, locked their doors and vowed not to leave their homes until the sun returned four months later. At first this seemed to be a reasonable strategy. Being so isolated and knowing that winter would give us naught but emptiness, we were all well stocked with enough provisions to last several winters. If we were prepared to barricade ourselves in against the cold and conditions, then why not against whatever was out there, unseen and stalking between the trees? Many began to make preparations to do just that. Stripping wood from their outhouses and buying up nails and boards from the one general store to reinforce their barricades. Until, that was, the first door was shattered. Luckily, that first time, no one had been home. Elias, the old man whose house had been invaded, had been at a church service when the intrusion happened. When it did happen, however, it became immediately clear that whatever it was that was waiting for us out there did not care for our fortifications. Barring doors and boarding windows would not keep us safe. The heavy timber frame of the door had splintered like matchwood, the locks and chains snapped and smashed whilst Bess, the dog left to guard the place, had been found dead, her skull completely, almost clinically, caved in. I remember looking at this unfortunate victim of whatever had broken in, and instantly regretting it. The image has stayed with me ever since. In all but one respect, the dog looked perfectly healthy. There were no tearing bites or slashed claw marks indicative of being mauled by some large predator such as a bear, nor was the body mutilated or partially eaten, as it most likely would have been had this been a bear attack. Rather, the only injury was a clean, almost perfectly circular blow to the very top of its head, a blow which had imploded the skull in a manner that reminded me of a hard-boiled egg someone had tapped sharply with the back of a spoon. It was as if someone, with expert timing and impossible force, had hit the poor thing with a sledgehammer, killing it instantly. I remember, oddly, that beneath my obvious concern and horror at the incident, another callous, less sensitive part of me did reflect that this method of dispatching animals seemed almost humane, that the animal would not have suffered, and that if the technique were to be discovered it could be very useful to the caribou herders when they were forced to euthanize sick or injured animals. The only other injury apparent on the dog was to its mouth, as a number of teeth were either broken or indeed snapped clean off, embedded it would seem in whatever thing had entered its territory. The other strange thing about this first break-in was the nature of the items removed. Whilst a hungry bear or scavenging animal would presumably consume anything and everything it could find, 
Whoever or whatever had broken into this cabin had been very selective, removing bread, specific tins, fruit, vegetables, and even a first aid kit. The perpetrator also made off, so Elias said, with several books. Some said this was an accident, that the bears, disturbed partway through their invasion, had escaped with anything they could grab clamped between their jaws. The books, they said, had been removed because the bears, with their acute sense of smell, would have picked up the scent of human beings left on the pages, cover, and spine. I did not believe it, nor did Elias, though he took steps to disprove it. If, he said, a bear killed Bess, then why had the dog's carcass been left intact? If the sounds we were hearing, the moaning wails of agony, were indeed an entire pack of hungry bears, would not they have torn her to pieces in seconds? Why were the hunks of meat left to defrost on the counter left untouched? When those supporting the theory gave no answer, Elias decided to find out for himself. Marching from his door with the limp body of his dog cradled in his arms, he proceeded, bravely or stupidly, towards the tree line until, after a few moments, his silhouette faded into the darkness and snow, and he disappeared from view. When he returned, he was empty-handed. If it's bears that killed Bess, he said, let them have the spoils of their hunt. They'll smell the body from miles off. If she's still there tomorrow, as I think she will be, then we know it ain't no bear. The others nodded, and that night, against the backdrop of darkness and the most hideous, pained and mournful wailing, we all, religious or not, prayed. Despite what had happened to Elias's cabin and the fact that we now knew it was futile, we still added extra reinforcements to our doors. Hoping that they would at least slow whatever was coming for us and allow us to escape. Then we waited, clutching mugs of scalding tea. We huddled by the fire as we muttered, discussed, and worried over what we might find in the morning. In all of those discussions, however, what we did find never came close to being suggested. At dawn the next morning, a dawn marked by the clock on the wall, but not by any movement of the sun, the dark remaining as steadfast, thick, and immovable as it had for the previous month, a group of us, armed with guns and heavy with terror, emerged from our cabins and headed for the tree line to see what had become of Bess. I remember our slow trudge through snow that was shin-deep out towards the trees, and I remember feeling as if we were wading through the silence. Everything, save for the grunts and sighs of our exertions, was still, and our voices sounded so massive, foreign, and intrusive when we spoke that eventually we all chose to remain silent each man clutching the icy metal shaft of his rifle, and hearing in his head, if not with his ears, the sound of that horrible wailing. What we found at the tree-line was as confusing as it was chilling. Bess was gone, or at least was no longer where she had been. She had not, however, been consumed, dragged into the forest, or mutilated. Instead, she had been buried— in the place just before the trees where Elias had laid his former companion, there now stood a small tower of rocks, piled one atop the other, below which a small plot had been dug, and into which her body had been placed. I, like everyone else there, was stunned. Everyone but Elias. Rather than the stunned silence the rest of us shared, he instead was muttering to himself and circling this strange plot, squatting every now and again to examine the space, to take measurements and to photograph the area around the grave, where the last embers of a small fire were still smouldering. "'It's people,' someone to my right said, his voice displaying the watery thinness that marks a descent into tears. "'People did this.' 
I was about to agree when Elias, rising from his squatted position, shaking his head furiously, kicked at the fire and shouted, loud enough for us all to be taken aback, "'Don't be so stupid!' He turned and began to walk back toward town, and, hurrying after him, my tearful friend called. "'Bears don't build fires, idiot! It's people! People have been here! They've broken in and killed your dog! They must have come from further north! Savage people! Cannibals! And—' Elias spun around to face us and marched quickly toward the speaker, grabbing him roughly by the neck of his coat and dragging him the few paces back to the grave. "'Idiot, eh? Idiot! Are you people blind? Those are rocks in a pile. When was the last time you saw a rock, eh? When was the last time you saw anything on the ground here that wasn't snow? Whoever or whatever put that there had to dig— through the ice, through the solid rock-hard earth that we can't but dent with a shovel, and take those rocks up from below. Look! Elias pointed to the disturbed earth all around the graveside, which was admittedly more brown dirt than I had seen for months. It was at this point that I saw the tears in his eyes, and realised that he wasn't simply angry. He was terrified. Look! he screamed again pointing at the ground around the pile of rocks. There in the snow, in the frozen pits of mud and dirt that rose and fell like the crests and falls of waves, were lines, long troughs and trenches dug into the snow, regular and spaced, as if the ground had been worked with a rake, or... Elias squatted, and before this pattern of lines, held his gloved hand out with the fingers spread. "'This isn't a spade,' Something clawed for them, got these rocks out by hand, by scraping and ripping at the earth. Looking back at the lines, I, for the first time, saw them as Elias was seeing them, as the marks of fingers that had gouged the earth, desperately digging and pulling up the frozen ground, frantically clawing so hard with bare hands that the snow was stained with black streaks of what looked like dried blood clawing with hands like no human being had ever had, the space between each finger being almost the width of three. Hands of a giant. Elias turned and stormed back toward town, as I observed the enormous craters in the snow that pitted the surface around the strange little grave, craters widely spaced and undeniably in the shape of feet, prints left by the immense stride of something huge. For the next three weeks, tales of giants, ape-men, and trolls circulated around the town. With each new break-in, each raid, the stories gained more traction. Two witnesses, who had managed to escape their cabins just before they were raided, spoke of a shape, massive and tattered, that hobbled and jerked forward in an awful, uncoordinated manner. The thing, they said, had the outline of a person— but so immense that it stooped to enter through the doors, the tops of which were themselves seven or eight feet from the ground. With each telling, the stories would become more elaborate, more violent, and more terrifying. Some spoke of Inuit mythologies, of Ukuano, a beast said to be half man, half bear, that would stalk the caribou and attack the herders, tearing out their intestines and smearing the steaming offal onto its skin. Others whispered of spirits that haunted the forest and would emerge every one hundred years to feast on the blood of men. One old woman, named Ona, swore that as a child she had seen one of the ogres that her father spoke of in hushed tones, twice the height of a man, wading through the waters offshore and hunting seals. She said that sometimes, in the summer months, you would see their scalps protruding out from between the tops of the trees. Perhaps, she said, they, like the bears, had been forced south by the melting pack ice and were looking for new prey. Eventually, fed up with these stories and the frenzy of hysteria they were causing in the town, the mayor called a town meeting, during which he asked that we not make such fabulous guesses, spread rumours, or weave our own folklores and mythologies. He said that spreading such stories only made people jumpy and paranoid. "'What we don't want?' he announced, is to increase the fear in town. 
Our job, he repeated over and over, was to stay calm and wait this thing out without losing our heads. There is nothing to be gained, he said, from turning fictions into fact. As he said this, Elias, who had been sitting quietly at the back of the room and who had refused to participate in this weaving of narratives, suddenly stood up and, without saying a word, marched from the room. Half an hour later, we watched, stunned, as his pickup skidded and slid carefully out of town, disappearing as he himself had earlier, into the darkness. It was whilst he was gone that I saw what I saw. I had been walking from the general store, which had now, like much of the town, adopted a siege mentality, and only opened for a few hours each week for people to buy essentials. I was hurrying back to my cabin, my coat bundled around me and hat pulled down almost to my eyeline, when I happened to glance out into the dark and see what at first looked like a snowman, or an immense scarecrow, made to be three or four times the size of a man. It was a thick, vaguely humanoid silhouette, an outline broken and warped by the darkness and the sheets of falling snow, so that the expected shape jutted out at strange, impossible angles. The shape was around eight feet in height and almost as wide across. The head, covered over with some kind of hood or cowl, reminded me of prisoners being led from court when the police throw a towel or blanket over them to conceal their identity. At first it didn't move, but instead simply stood watching, waiting. This immense dark shape, like some silent reaper on the edge of town, watched. I saw no features, only a deep black outline, a shape indistinct and malformed that began in a slow, haphazard, and distinctly painful-looking locomotion to shuffle in slow, laborious movements back into the dark and back toward the trees. I ran for my life. It was almost a week later, in a lull between the wailing, that another sound, low and rumbling, was heard through the town. The sound, I knew immediately, of a motor engine. Elias's truck. The car rolled unsteadily back into town, and, to the surprise of many, contained only Elias. Most had presumed that if he had managed to reach a city, he would have brought people with him, the police or the wildlife agencies with nets and guns, or else he might have brought a fleet of cars back with him so that we might all be evacuated. Instead, he arrived alone, with a large tarp fastened over the flat back of his truck, stocked, it seemed, with provisions. He just went to stock up for himself. He hasn't raised the alarm at all, some screeched, calls to which Elias did not respond. Instead, he simply rolled his car up beside his cabin, got out, and went inside. I was part of the small crowd that gathered outside his house, filled with questions and hopes of a solution, an escape. When he emerged moments later with his sled, he did not answer questions. Instead, he addressed the gathered crowd, not with an explanation, but with an instruction. "'All of this,' he said, waving at whatever was under the tarp, "'needs to go out there.' He waved at the darkness outside of town, to the blank expanses beyond the reach of our electric lights and out toward the tree line. It needs to go out there and it will get there much faster if you help. If you don't, I'll take the damn stuff myself. Despite there being scores in the crowd, only a half dozen, including myself, volunteered. I, like them, was scared, but I believed that Elias had the answer to that fear, and even if he didn't, what use would hiding do against a thing like that? Over the next hour, without ever questioning why or what exactly we were shifting, we loaded the heavy wooden crates onto sleds, pulling from the back of the pickup and placing them carefully onto the pallets as Marnie and Jan fastened up the dogs. Then we headed out, dragging whatever strange cargo Elias had brought out to a point by Bessie's grave. It took us two hours, during which not a single person spoke. That night, for the first time in over five weeks, there was only dark and silence outside. The howling had stopped. The following night, I visited Elias in his cabin. 
not because I was scared for him or myself, because I wanted to thank or praise him, but simply because I had to know. He welcomed me in, and after an hour or so, waiting to see if the howls would come again, I asked him what was in the crates. "'Amongst other things?' he said with a wry smile. "'Oranges. "'It was that thing that the mayor said,' he continued, "'about fiction becoming fact. "'It made me wonder, and eventually convinced me. "'What if it isn't about fiction becoming fact, "'but the other way around, fact becoming fiction? "'What if, two hundred years ago, "'a British girl living in Switzerland, "'the daughter of a writer and one of the first great feminists, "'penned a story of horror based on fact "'and presented it as fiction?' A story about a doctor obsessed with the secrets of life and death, about an abomination stitched together from the remnants dragged from the grave, which in the doctor's workshop of filthy creation he instilled with the spark of life. Maybe there's a reason that book was first published anonymously, and it was amongst those stolen from my shelves. I regarded him stunned, following what he was suggesting, but not for a second believing that it might be real. Elias sensed this, and, moving forward, took both of my hands in his, staring deep into my eyes with a conviction I have rarely seen in any other person. I know it sounds insane, but think about it. Sailors for years have talked about strange noises coming from the ice— some have even spoken about seeing a dark figure, many times bigger than a man, standing perfectly still on the ice. What if Nona really did see an ogre wading in the waters between the pack ice? What if there really is something out there that we all know about, that we could even give a name to, but which we never thought was real? At the end of that novel, a creature robbed of a soul and yet feeling, mourning every moment of its pain and rejection, walks out onto the frozen wastes of the Arctic with a promise never to return. But what if it had no choice? What if it was forced to come back? Now I'm not talking Boris Karloff, flatheads and neck bolts. I'm talking about a wretched, tattered thing, sewn together and capable of wrath and yet cursed with emotions, a thing that reads Milton and speaks in poetry, a thing that can never, ever die, but which will always, always suffer. Can you imagine a thing like that not howling into the night in anguish and pain? Pain? I asked, reluctantly admitting with this question that I was, however implausibly, going along with his suggestion. Pain, Elias echoed, and finally, releasing my hands, rose to his feet and reached for a book. From a page he had clearly marked earlier, he read, But a most extraordinary circumstance, and what would be scarcely credible upon any single evidence, is that the scars of wounds which had been for many years healed were forced open again by this virulent distemper, for though he was cured soon after, and had continued well for a great number of years past, yet on his being attacked by the scurvy, his wounds, in the progress of his disease, broke out afresh, and appeared as if they had never been healed. Nay, what is still more astonishing, the callus of a broken bone, which had been completely formed for a long time, was found to be hereby dissolved, and the fracture seemed as if it had never been consolidated. He snapped the book shut and stared at me for a long time. That's from George Anson's A Voyage Around the World, published in 1748. It tells of how a man injured at the Battle of the Boyne, whose scars and bones had completely healed, found that when he contracted scurvy, the healing was reversed. It isn't fiction. A lack of vitamin C, which causes scurvy, also stops collagen production. What people don't realise is that scarring isn't something that happens and is then finished and over with. It's an ongoing, continuous process. 
if there isn't enough collagen when the process stops and scars that have been knitted closed, fully healed for years, centuries even, suddenly split, popping back open, bones that have been broken and reset suddenly start to splinter. He paused, and, lifting a copy of the book to which he had been referring, showed me an illustration on the cover. I saw, as he had seen, a patched network of stitching and scars. There isn't much vitamin C out on the ice. That thing, if it is what I think it is, must be in agony, he hissed. I brought oranges, asorbic acid tablets and vitamin C supplements, liquid treatments for scurvy with empty syringes and piles upon piles of painkillers. I also brought books, poetry, literature, encyclopedias, to heal those other less visible wounds. I might be wrong. This might all be a ridiculous theory and that howling might have come from a pack of bears, but I don't think so. The thing is, if I'm right and if what I've given can help, then we'll probably never know. We'll never see that thing again. It'll disappear back into the dark and cold. Elias was partly right. We never saw any dark figures again, and the howling, having stopped that night, never resumed. We were, however, not completely without evidence. When spring finally arrived, berries, nuts, and the first of those beautiful wildflowers that grow even despite the frost were left outside of Elias's door. When autumn arrived, each house in the village would wake to find huge piles of firewood, already cut from the forest, and bundled outside their cabins. As winter approached, another town meeting was held. This time, however, there was no fear, but rather a glimmer of understanding. In the last days of meagre daylight, Elias returned to the tree-line once again with a dog. This time, however, the canine was alive and happy, a puppy born in autumn and strong enough to last the night outside. With the blessings of the whole town, he tied the tiny pup to a tree on the edge of the forest and returned to town. We never saw the pup again, but the following morning, fastened to the same tree, was a page from one of the books Elias had donated, with the words, Thank you, friend, scrawled upon it in charcoal. This has been Howling in the North, a short horror story, written by Stories from the Attic, narrated by Robin McConnell, copyright 2023 by Michael Vandervoort, production copyright by Michael Vandervoort.